first I want to start with a few words about format. I'm going to give a brief introduction and I'll introduce panels, panelists, and then we're going to uh, have a discussion and at the end there'll be time for question and answer. Um, so first, why are we here? Uh, ICANN is a California-based nonprofit. They currently perform uh, what is called the IANA functions and these include global allocation of IP addresses and management of top-level domain name system um, known as the root zone. And these functions are managed through a contract with the U.S. government, but tomorrow that contract is ending. Um, and four, it's notable that four Republican AGs did file a lawsuit yesterday uh, to stop the transition, and it's unclear where that's going to go, but right after this panel at 1.30, there's a hearing on that. Um, so after this transition occurs, ICANN's going to be governed purely by a multi-stakeholder model. Uh, and this model includes uh, technical experts, academics, uh, companies and other members of civil society, and we have today some of those members that have joined us. Uh, so let me introduce the panelists. First to my left, uh, Eli Dorado is a research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University and director of its technology policy program. He's a member of the State Department's International Telecommunication Advisory Committee and has served on several U.S. delegations to U.N. treaty and policy conferences. Uh, to his left, uh, Dr. Mueller is a professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology and co-founder of the Internet Govern Governance Project. His two books on this subject and one that's coming out include Networks and States and Ruling the Root. And then Jonathan Zuck is president of the App Association. Uh, he was a former app developer himself and has experience working in the software industry. So to start, uh, I would like Eli to uh, talk about your history working on this issue how did you get involved and why? And then we'll move to the next panelist. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, so I got involved uh, in internet, international internet policy issues uh, beginning in 2012 at the uh, at the Wicket. The Wicket um, was a treaty conference uh, under the auspices of the of the UN's uh, International Telecommunication Union, and uh, that was sort of the last time that governments of the world sort of tried to stand up and revolt uh, against the fact that the, UN, the U.S. had so much control over the Internet, and they tried to get uh, articles about uh, addressing the Internet into, into the international treaty that, that governs uh, the international telephone system and other telecommunications. So I was involved in that by, uh, by actually hosting leaked documents with my colleague, Jerry Brito. We had a site called Wicket Leaks. Uh, and we, we hosted leaked documents from that meeting, uh, and I ended up going to that meeting and have, have followed uh, these issues closely ever since. I remember coming back from that meeting and, and thinking, we should really just, get, you know, get rid of the U.S. role and 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 uh, in, in overseeing uh, the root zone file, and that would really solve a lot of these problems. So uh, I was excited to see that that happened, but been following these issues uh, very closely ever since. Milton? All right. Um, so I was involved in this uh, basically from the beginning of ICANN. Um, there was, when the Internet was really taking off in the mid-90s, um, there was kind of an informal international community of technical people who were suddenly debating this idea that the route might be split and should we have competing routes. Uh, and uh, my ears pricked up, this is a very interesting issue. I started uh, looking at it. And uh, the process of resolving these issues about how to manage the DNS route back in the mid-90s uh, turned into this new global institution called ICANN. And I found this to be a really good thing that we were essentially sort of starting from scratch. We were not pushing this into the ITU. We were not pushing this into the U.S. government. We were creating kind of an international community, or rather a transnational community, of people who are managing and stakeholders in the Internet to create a regime for solving these problems uh, on their own. And the big issue at the time was essentially jurisdictional fragmentation. Uh, that is, we didn't want there to be 192 different domain name system rules. We wanted the domain name system to be holding the internet together on a global basis. And so ICANN was the strategy of what I call internationalization through privatization. That instead of creating a global treaty with states coming together and signing something, 
we were going to have a private sector entity that was going to globally govern through the issuance of private contracts. It would all be under private law. And the U.S., uh, the Clinton administration uh, did this and supported this idea. And their original idea was after two years, we're going to step away from ICANN and get out of the picture entirely. Well, that never happened. And we have been having a debate about the U.S. role ever since. In fact, I can't resist... Uh, dragging out this old paper that we wrote after the World Summit on the Information Society. And you see the date here, it's July 2005. And it's about the U.S. role in Internet governance. This is when, during the World Summit, the U.S. issued a statement under the Bush administration saying, basically, we control the DNS and we think it's necessary and we have no plans to stop doing that. Uh, and the, I went through the critique that we made at that time of, of the U.S. role, and it's just exactly the same as the debate we've been having for the past uh, couple months, uh, thanks to Senator Cruz. So for me, this is like hopefully the closing of the chapter. This is the finalization of this uh, private uh, <coughs> innovative global governance regime that we tried to create, and I'm hoping that it goes through. Thanks. Jonathan? Uh, yes, uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me to the talk. Uh, I suppose my interaction with the Internet began in the late 80s programming sockets, uh, so it was a very uh, different introduction to this. And when ICANN came about, I, like many people in the uh, non-Internet technology community, just regarded it as, some, as something that was happening and working, and it the system seemed to be going fine, and so we paid very little attention to it. Until 2005, when uh, some representatives from the European Union, who <laughs> we had previously regarded as allies, suggested that, uh, that maybe the ICANN functions should move to uh, a UN-style body instead. And uh, that woke up, my members woke up us to be more uh, uh, active in our participation within ICANN. And so I, my participation in ICANN began in 2005, uh, back when uh, uh, Dr. Mueller told me at a uh, cocktail party that the ITU is a paper tiger and that I shouldn't worry about them. Um, and so uh, I'm, uh, I've remained worried, and, and uh, taking my lead from the movie Pretty Woman, I regarded ICANN as an organization ripe for takeover because of having a lot of money, cash on hand, and weak management. And I regarded the United States' oversight of ICANN as similarly weak, and the, and the MOUs and joint project agreements that have been signed to be fairly weak sauce uh, management, if you will, of ICANN. And what was needed was structural reform within the organization. And I think the entire community has been working toward that, uh, you know, uh, that, since its inception. But an inflection point occurred uh, a few years ago when the Department of Commerce announced this transition. And I think that created enough momentum within the community to really force some structural reform within ICANN that hardens it as an organization and improves uh, its manageability by the Internet community that it, it serves. And so I was part of the uh, accountability half of that process, and uh, others, including Milton, were involved in the uh, um, numbers part of that and, the, and PTI and some of those other things that you'll be hearing about. So there's sort of two halves to that effort. Uh, that preceded uh, uh, the Department of Commerce's decision to finalize this transition. So I guess that's been my participation. Now I'm now uh, chairing the uh, Affirmation of Commitments mandated review of the new GTLD program and the degree to which it's expanded, truly expanded competition, consumer trust, uh, and, uh, and um, consumer choice. So Could you explain what the GTLD that. program is? Well, GTLDs are generic top-level domains, and top-level domains are the thing to the right of the period, .com, .net, .org, right? And so the new GTLD program is a little bit of a misnomer in that there have been many variations on introduction of additional top-level domains throughout the history of ICANN, but most recently there was a very rapid expansion of, of TLDs, and so it went from 20 to 1,500 fairly quickly. And so now we have dot .gallery, dot .photography, et cetera. There's still problems with, uh, you know, uh, websites accepting these things as email addresses, something we call universal acceptance. But this new GTLD program that when we talk about it, we're generally referring to this most recent incarnation, this round, uh, that had 1,800 applicants for new uh, top-level strings. Thank you. 
Great. So you mentioned structural reforms. What is actually going to change tomorrow? What's going to be different? You want me to answer that? Sure. So hopefully what happens tomorrow is, number one, uh, the IANA functions are somewhat detached from ICANN and put into a separate corporation. And each of the three communities that use the IANA functions, names, numbers, and protocols, will have an independent uh, contracting authority as to who they want to select as their IANA functions provider. That's the most dry technical part of the change. Uh, the, there was a debate in the reforms. Uh, people like me wanted to yank IANA completely away from ICANN and make ICANN what it's supposed to be, which is the policy-making body. And we wanted to have the technical implementation of policy to be separated from ICANN. ICANN fought like hell to not allow that to happen. It would be kind of a diminishment of their power. And some people were afraid of the idea that uh, the IANA would be uh, free-floating. Um, and so they opted with a halfway house in which we uh, have a separate subsidiary of ICANN, which is controlled by ICANN but has a couple of independent board members. And the community has the right to fire ICANN. At least in theory, they have the right to fire ICANN and hire another IANA functions provider if they wish. So that, again, is the dry technical part of the transition. The more interesting part is the things to which Jonathan alluded, where we're creating uh, massive uh, governance reforms in ICANN. Again, if you go back to this 10-year-old paper, we were saying... The U.S. has to get out, but there's accountability, serious accountability problems within ICANN. And so whatever we do in the process of, of making uh, that change, getting the U.S. out, we have to uh, reform ICANN's accountability arrangements. So I think I've talked long enough. Uh, I don't want to describe in detail those accountability arrangements, mm -hmm. but essentially we have tried to make ICANN more accountable and we've, uh, again, there's a big power struggle about that. We've, we've entered some kind of a halfway house in that regard, too. But definitely the accountability arrangements are improved over what they used to be. And we also have a more well-defined and hopefully narrowly scoped mission statement and that we want to keep ICANN within. Great. Jonathan, you worked on the accountability side. Which of those mechanisms is important, and, and is it going to work? Well, I'll tackle the first question and, and then uh, do my best to punt the second question, I guess. But the, um, there basically, the idea was to empower uh, the Internet community within ICANN to hold ICANN to account. So throughout the history of ICANN, there have been many uh, studies and reforms, et cetera, that have had accountability in their name. But the net result was zero mechanisms of actual binding accountability. Everything uh, led to the ability to recommend, the ability to request etc. And none of them, in fact, were empowering, or per se, review. of the, uh, yeah, to request review or something like that. Right. None of them were empowering, per se, to uh, the communities involved. And, and so th these reform mechanisms, just taken writ large, were uh, meant to give the last word, if you will, to the community that ICANN is meant to serve. And so there's these sort of five essential uh, powers that were granted to the community as a whole. Uh, one was the ability to veto the budget and, and, and essentially put the budget into something similar to what we're doing now, which is a kind of a de minimis budget, um, until that uh, is resolved. And, and so that empowers the community a great deal to affect the way that ICANN spends its money. Uh, the second is uh, the ability to um, veto uh, changes to the bylaws of ICANN if they are um, after they're ruled on by the board the ability to approve changes to what have become known as fundamental bylaws. So there's a se section of the bylaws that are regarded as fundamental. The community has the ability to approve changes to that. There's also the ability to remove individual board members and the ability to spill the entire board if that situation is called for. And so these are fairly significant powers now granted to the community or will be with the new by bylaws that... Uh, have been approved uh, by the community, by NTIA, and now by the ICANN board that should be put in place as a function of the transition. In addition, and also very important to a number of people within the community, we've instituted binding um, independent review mechanisms. There were mechanisms for independent review, but all they did was result in a recommendation 
as opposed to a binding ruling. And so now there's binding mechanisms for independent review for individuals that feel wrong done by, by decisions or policies that have been implemented by ICANN. Now, as whether or not they'll work, I, I think that's difficult to say. I believe so. I think that the objective, um, I, th I think the biggest failing of this is accountability package is that it's too big and too involved and suffers from the same problem the European Constitution did when they dropped a phone book size thing on everybody's doorstep and said, hey, a week from now, let us know if you're okay with this. It, 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 it's in a, in a sense too evolved and it might have been enough just to have the powers related to removing directors, et cetera, because the objective was simply to give the community sufficient teeth to bring about incremental reform indefinitely into the future because it, the organization is one of continuous improvement and it was about simply giving the last word to the community. So I, I believe that sufficient power has been granted the community to bring about reform. I th I'm sure that a lot of kinks will work themselves out over time, but I think in a gross way, you know, I can answer the question that I believe the mechanisms that are proposed will in fact work to hold ICANN accountable and prevent it from being the next FIFA. Sure. So there are a lot of concerns about Russia, China, and Iran, foreign governments having a lot of sway over ICANN. Um, are those concerns legitimate, Eli? Uh, so ICANN does have a uh, governmental advisory committee, which is uh, a, a body that where governments meet to help inform uh, ICANN policy, and they uh, sort of by consensus, which means lacking any formal objections, can, can give advice to the board, which the board has to follow uh, unless it uh, explicitly rejects that advice. And so um, I, d I don't think anything in this, you know, but removing oversight I don't think really affects uh, the power of, of the GAC, as it's called. Um, there, there is a, a change now. It's a super, ma super majority to reject GAC advice, just one more additional board member. Um, so uh, I'm not very concerned about uh, additional uh, Russia, China, uh, Iran influence over over the domain name system. I could, uh, I'd like to get in on this yeah. one. Yeah. Um, so, again, uh, if you look at the new GTLD program that Jonathan was talking about, uh, you're dealing with names, with semantics. So there are censorship issues that arise in terms of the approval of top-level domains. Now, all during that GTLD program, all during it, governments, including indeed led by the U.S. government, were advocating the suppression of sensitive names, of controversial names. Uh, there was a big debate over whether there should be some standard for uh, rejecting names. Uh, and uh, the U.S. government eventually, first they proposed that we would take some concept called morality and public order drawn from trademark law, and then they ultimately they said, you know, that doesn't really work, which we, of course, had told them before. So we think that government should be able to object to a name for any reason. For any reason. Now, where was Ted Cruz during this debate? Where were the people who were saying we're subjecting the Internet to censorship during that debate? Uh, I was screaming. I was writing blog posts. I was telling people to get involved. Where were all these people who are suddenly concerned when the U.S. government <coughs> is relinquishing control that we are uh, somehow subjecting uh, the Internet to uh, special kinds of controls? Now, two other issues here. Now that we have the reforms, what is different about the GAC? Number one, I would say the GAC remains dangerous in the sense that governments are always a force for control. But they have, power has been limited in a very significant way. Uh, we have formalized the rule that whatever advice they give has to be by consensus. It can't be a majority. It cannot be, uh, you know, the G77 block uh, voting down the OECD block, right? Uh, so that means that any government can object uh, and can hold up a GAC consensus if they have the uh, courage to do so, which they frequently Some, sometimes do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's one thing. Now, second thing is, even as, even if that wasn't the case, uh, there's nothing in the reforms that relatively empower Russia and China over any other government, right? I mean, you could just as well say uh, 
we're turning the internet over to Guatemala or uh, the uh, Netherlands Antilles. Uh, and so the, the Russia-China meme is kind of a scare tactic and a nationalistic kind of uh, thing related to you know the birtherism claim or the the idea that uh, Obama is uh, you know a Muslim or something. Uh, I just think it's a a very irrational, nationalistic form of politics that uh, should be soundly rejected. I, th I think, uh, and I may also be quoting uh, Dr. Muller on this point from the past as well, in addition to being dangerous, GAC is probably also the best friend of ICANN because it represents governments participating in a process in which they do not have uh, direct power. They only have an advisory role within mm -hmm. ICANN. And sure, there's this uh, commitment by the board to try and reconcile their decisions with GAC advice, but it still is advice. And so it's a bunch of governments that have all decided to participate in a very important system, right? The internet that's come, become so important to all governments, they've all decided to participate in a system in which their role is purely advisory. And so that act of participation, I think, is an, in, an incredible uh, rhetorical tool for uh, governments around the world and, and for ICANN and so I think we got to always look at the GAC as a two-edged sword. I think they're our best friend, uh, as well as the, the the danger around the corner if they if they get out of hand. I'd like to say that I, I agree with that. It's a very astute observation by uh, Jonathan that if you talk to GAC members uh, within ICANN, by putting all the governments in the room as governments, huge mistake. I opposed it from the beginning. and But if once you've done that, uh, within ICANN, the government's are always saying, you know, they should listen to us. We should be more powerful within ICANN. On the other hand, if you talk about ICANN to the rest of the world, to the UN, to the ITU, the people who actively participate in the GAC are the greatest advocates of the multi-stakeholder model uh, in the broader context. So they basically, the, by giving them a role, you have bought them into the regime, and that's I think was part of the U.S. strategy and one of the more reasonable explanations for why they were so concerned about, you know, governments having these kinds of arbitrary powers over TLDs. Sure. So states can defect from ICANN's network. Um, how likely is what people have been calling like balkanization or internet fragmentation and what would that mean for the average user of the internet? Anybody can take that. I, I th I tend to think that it, it will happen at some point, uh, maybe not from the ICANN system, but I think more um, defecting from the way the Internet is routed today might uh, might occur at some point in the future. Um, this is called the, the other term I've heard is splinternet. Um, so suppose, a, you know, a country um, decides that it wants to make it, it, its domestic internet more like the uh, international telephone system where there's a, a number prefix for to access that country and keeps all uh, domestic traffic routed sort of internally and bridges with the with the global internet through only a, a small number of choke points. I could see that happening um, but I don't I, I don't think um, I don't think that the the Naming system is the primary means through which that's going to happen. I think it's. I think it's more likely to be routing. I agree that it will never happen with ra with naming. Um, essentially, the network externalities are so overwhelmingly powerful, um, and there's nothing stopping anybody from uh, starting an alternate DNS route today. And indeed, when ICANN was uh, abysmally slow and restrictive with its uh, so-called early new TLD programs, uh, there were commercial interests who tried to start uh, alternate routes, who basically said, let's just... Indeed, that's how I got involved in ICANN. We were talking about competing routes back in 1995-96, after Network Solutions was first authorized to charge money. Suddenly people started saying, why can't I have a new domain that mints money the way .com does? And when uh, nobody was able to give it to them, they said, well, let's just start a new route and have all kinds of new top-level domains. Well, uh, unless the routes are coordinated, uh, you 
your use of a domain name may not know where to find the IP address associated with the domain, so you will be uh, fragmented unless everybody recognizes your root. And uh, who's going to buy a domain name that doesn't work universally? Uh, it's just not a very good economic proposition for the supplier or for the buyer. And this, uh, you know, there was actually some chance in 2000, maybe 96, uh, definitely 96, there was some chance, maybe as late as 2002, 2003, an alternate route could have gotten traction. But today, it's completely out of the question. I mean, who's going to use it? All of the TLDs are, you know, all of these new TLDs, uh, massive infrastructure. It's just uh, unlikely to, to ever happen at the DNS level. I mean, at the same time, China is doing precisely that. I mean, they have an alternate route uh, inside the country they're using for censorship purposes and things. And so it's not technically that difficult. And I think it's important to remember that ISPs, right, the people you buy your Internet service from, uh, are the ones that actually, if they ever got together, are in control of all of this. And if you think about it, half the governments in the UN have complete control over the ISPs inside their countries. So, I mean, I, you know, I, it's, it's easy to say that it's completely impossible, but I mean, different incremental versions of it, different kinds of fragmentation, uh, you know, I, I think are possible even within the namespace because we already, we know it empirically because it's already happening today. Now, when you say China has an alternate route, uh, what do you mean exactly? They have name servers? Yes, and they they supplement them and replace some with uh, localized versions of, of domains. There's, there's domains that resolve to different servers inside China than they do outside of China. Um, well, we'll have to take that well, up. And, and I would say one other thing is, is that I think that um, there have been some experiments lately with not alternate uh, routes that compete with the with the with the other with the existing domain names, but uh, attempts to come up with new pseudo top level domains that are not formally recognized by Anna that uh, could operate through like a blockchain mechanism, for instance. So uh, there's been attempts. Uh, there was a dot bit for a while, which was going to be built on uh, on something called Namecoin, which is, seems to be languishing. Um, mm. and, and I think by, uh, I think there's the, the new plan that I've heard lately is there's going to be a, a dot F ETH, uh, on, built on, on top of Ethereum on something called the Ethereum name service that should be operable by the end of the year and you'll be able to use it by the end of the year and, and browse to it. So, you know, I think that insofar <laughs> as those efforts, um, do do proceed i think it's going to be very incremental and and very um very focused on just getting you know one top level domain uh up and running and not really trying to be do the same job as the root as coor in coordinating a bunch of other uh domain names at the same time but why wouldn't you just you know spend a half a million dollars and get a new tld from ICANN? Um, so they so they could very well do it. Uh, the Ethereum community raised 150 million dollars for something else uh, recently. So so they could do that. The the precedent that was actually set with uh, with Tor uh, top level domain names was to just go through the IETF and have an RFC at the IETF instruct IANA to reserve uh, a name for that purpose. So so that's. It's interesting to see how we deal with people squatting on pseudo top level domains, and and you know even it's a way of avoiding I I can or IANA fees to just go ahead and start squatting, make use of it. Internet community sees that you're using it, and they say, okay, we'll we'll make a special exception for you, and and there is a procedure by which uh, IETF can reserve top level domains for use outside of the IANA system. So, um, so that's. I think that's, that's still an interesting avenue for the future, and, and it's something I'll be watching uh, carefully as we, we see, how the inter we'll see how the Internet evolves. Of course, the Internet is not a static thing, right? So, so um, this isn't this is one of the things that I want to emphasize about the, the IANA transition. We're not making ICANN to last 300 years necessarily, right? It, it, uh, the Internet 20 years from now could look very, very different. Or so, not. Or not. Right. That's, or not. What, that's what people said in 1998. Yeah. It's like, domain names are not going to be any around anymore. They're not going to well, be important. Well, we have uh, search engines. <laughs> so, so we don't know. Uh, yeah. But, but uh, continuing to watch the evolution of, of the Internet, I think, is something that's really important. Well, I agree that there, there's room for technical innovation in naming. But uh, 
just the, the, the magic words for me are backwards compatibility. Mm -hmm. So whatever innovations you're going to do, they're going to yeah. be powerful incentives. And uh, this is the problem with IP version 6. There's no backwards compatibility, and where are we with that? It's not going so well. So um, it's, you know, I can't see anybody doing anything. Uh-oh, uh Tim is going to be mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, but I guess the thing is, if we look at um, Ted Cruz's notion that the U.S. is somehow in control of the DNS because of the ability to reallocate the IANA contract, what would the practical implications of that be? The uh, practical implications of that would be is, I can, you no longer get to manage this spreadsheet, basically, right, that sits out on the web for everybody to read. I now designate that Stanford University will manage that spreadsheet, right? That's essentially what they're saying. So that's, that's now saying that world community, you should pay attention to Stanford's spreadsheet now instead of ICANN's spreadsheet. Why couldn't we just say no? Mm -hmm. Right? That's backwardly compatible. Yeah. The, the, right? I mean, the, the I, I'm just going to keep using the route that ICANN is using, despite what the U.S. government said about Stanford now being the owner of the route. It's all about consensus. Right? Exactly. It's not, it's not about actually formal. And that would require no technical innovations. Well. That would yep. require, in fact, it would require less change. <gasps> But there's a lot than, of... Than adhering uh, to, to, to that, that commandment by the U.S. government. You think of the um, technical changes required if you have your hints file that's pointing all of this name server software to a specific roots. Some people are going to change that and some people are not going to change that if they're ordered to by their government. Um, if the U.S. government did that, uh, if they fragmented the root, I think the root would be fragmented uh, because they have enough uh, clout with major operators like VeriSign and, um, you know, the Department of Defense uh, root servers that um, you might get fragmented. But this is kind of a religious debate. I mean, it's like uh, we're, we're projecting what might happen and what might not happen. I think the only takeaway message here is network externalities are overwhelmingly powerful in this market. Uh, backward compatibility, it would be most rational for people to maintain that. Uh, so the likelihood of a significant split in the next 20, 30 years in the DNS is, is very low. I would actually say I think that Apple and Microsoft have the most power here, right? Because they can build into their operating systems what, you know, what the root name servers are. So, so they're, they're the, you know, if, if, I think if you had... Apple and Microsoft deciding we want to go with a different route and without, you know, government interference with that, let's say, I think they could do it. They so really the government of Ireland is probably going to decide <laughs> the government of the Ireland the uh, DNS, is, is, think, is, so. has the most control. <coughs> I think it's Google that actually runs a, 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 a DNS service. Uh, and I'm not sure what the whether the Apple or Microsoft operating systems don't point you to the root zone file. It's actually the bind software uh, that is used by name servers rather than... Mm. But I guess uh, at, the, at the end user level there might be some room for, for influence there, definitely, and you shouldn't overlook that. Yeah. So I want to go back to Ethereum because I think it's a cool solution. Um, how does that work in, in practice? Some have called it more decentralized than, than a multi-stakeholder process that we have now because there wouldn't be... It could be individual actors and it could be really uh, a, a newer way to approach this problem. What what does that look like in functionality? Could there be special interests? Uh, I, I think yes. I think it wouldn't get you out necessarily of the multi-stakeholder model. Uh, yeah. You would still need some sort of governance mechanisms to figure out, you know, what what's the appropriate pricing for second-level domains under the dot f subdomain. What you know, are there bans on certain strings, etc. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that would be really different about it would be that this would all be uh, decided in code. So this would be code that, that people um, people know who has the right to update it and and um, and agree to use the root. Uh, their, their consensus to use the root is is a function of visible smart contract code that would be um, published and, and inspectable. Um, and they would have some some you know software guarantees, you know blockchain based guarantees um, that uh, that's actually the procedure that would be used to 
uh, make those decisions. So I think that there would still, you know, if this if this got to be big, I think you would still need sort of stakeholders to get together and decide how should that smart contract that governs the the root of the .f domain how should that be structured and um, what sorts you know what sorts of rules should apply. Um, so it doesn't doesn't quite solve doesn't totally solve the problem, but it it, it does uh, it does get rid of um, some of the I guess some of the ambiguity that that occurs just from having a, an extremely human institution you know like I can and, and replacing it with uh, with software to a considerable extent. So internet governance uh, is something we keep coming back to. Looks like we can't quite get rid of it. Uh, the definition has changed over time, and now it includes things that we would normally attribute as internet policy to be governed by governments or ISPs, like content policy or intellectual property. Uh, some have referred to this as mission creep. Uh, is that a real concern, and, and how can we deal with that? Well, we uh, that was a big concern of many of us involved in the reforms, and we had a... Um, <clears throat> a redraft of the mission statement of ICANN, uh, which was designed to uh, make it as narrow as possible, make it focused on coordination of the DNS and not much more. And then we had uh, a little version of what we, you know, the First Amendment for ICANN's new constitution, which is uh, this uh, section that says basically uh, ICANN shall not uh, use its authority over coordinating the DNS to regulate content. And immediately we ran into mitigations of this prohibition because basically of two forces, uh, mainly the intellectual property interests. The intellectual property interests want us to regulate, to use ICANN to regulate content. Maybe uh, Jonathan will moderate my statement there, but uh, basically they do. And so they want to stick into registrar and registry contracts uh, intermediary responsibility. They want to say to the registrar, you got to check whether this site is doing illegal things or not, and if they do, and we notify you, you yank them off of the internet. Uh, and for trademark stuff, um, you know, you might think that's justified, you might not, but the problem is that opens the door to all kinds of intermediary responsibility and regulation of content. So. How that will play out will really be decided by the by the independent review process and the challenges. We will be setting precedents, uh, and it will be very interesting to see how that works out. And uh, if the people who are com com complaining about the prospect of censorship post-transition would actually help us to uh, do these things, I would be very appreciative. So, I, as a member of the intellectual property constituency, I will... Uh, put that caveat out front that uh, uh, obviously intellectual property is an ongoing uh, challenge for uh, intellectual property holders uh, in the United States and around the world and trying to find as many creative ways to uh, manage and control uh, the use of that property is, is an ongoing challenge. And so I don't want to split hairs uh, necessarily, but I think what the intellectual property community wants is for registrars to hold uh, registrants to the agreements they sign with them, which is not to engage in illegal activity. And and so I could use an extreme and inflammatory example like child pornography or something, where everyone will collectively gasp and have no problem with uh, this type of contract enforcement taking place. And so I do. what we're doing instead is saying, well, in most cases is saying, well, but that's more important than this is, or this right is more important than that right. And I think we just need to be cautious of that. So there are contracts in place. When you go and register a domain name, you agree on a con your contract with GoDaddy that you won't be using this website for illegal purposes. That's in your contract. And so what the, what the intellectual property community writ large wants is for those registrars to enforce those contracts. And we do everything we can to help them by pointing out when they are, in fact, violating the terms of the contract that they've signed with a registrar. So, I mean, that is the kind of discussion that's going on, and it has a lot of fuzzy edges, I will admit. And so there's a lot of points of tension and discussion within the ICANN community that will continue indefinitely, which is why, even as an intellectual property proponent, I'm in favor of the transition rather than holding it up in hopes that we will somehow perfect uh, intellectual property protection provisions uh, 
uh, within ICANN's bylaws, because I don't believe we will. I believe it will be an ongoing iterative process that will continue uh, indefinitely, and that tension will continue to exist indefinitely as well, but uh, it's a fight we'll have, we'll have to keep fighting. But I think that none of those things should stand in the way of the transition that hopefully will take place tomorrow. Yeah, just a quick follow-up. Um, the, the issue is not whether child pornography should be illegal or whether, uh, you know, people shouldn't do illegal things. The question is, who's going to enforce that? So do you want your registrar to be, you know, basically selling you a domain name and a name server, or do you want them to be a policeman who's uh, ensuring that you're not doing anything illegal. I mean, think of how broad that, that is, and think about what that illegal means in China or Russia. Uh, so if you're requiring registrars to be the policemen, uh, it's, it's kind of a strange uh, delegation of responsibility and it has severe consequences for freedom of speech and uh, other kinds of freedom, even economics freedom, uh, in places where uh, maybe the laws are not so liberal. And even here in the United States, if you're running a meth lab in your house, your house can be repossessed by, by the police, right? I mean, I, I, there are the authorities police. that are giving you Not by your uh, real access to property. Are All there right. any other aspects? It's going to be an ongoing discussion. <laughs> <laughs> are there any other aspects of mission creep, such as like cybersecurity? We talked about law enforcement a little bit, uh, or privacy that are that should be concerning. Um, or is there anything that's of great concern to you about the transition that needs to be worked out, aside from intellectual property? Well, I think a, a freestanding ICANN uh, and its role in global cybersecurity issues is a very interesting issue. I don't have any particular fears or specifics, uh, but there are going to be sort of uh, global public goods related to stability and security of these systems, right? And the question is, do we need new institutional frameworks to handle those? How much of that can be incorporated into the ICANN framework? How much of it will be taken over by governments uh, and international treaty arrangements? Uh, or how much can we continue on this innovative path towards a, a non-state-based uh, security system? I think that's a really interesting question long-term. I think the long-term question I'm thinking about the most right now is, I think the U.S. government in particular has been hampered in its ability to articulate a uh, sort of inspiring liberal vision for the Internet because it gets called out so much on the hypocrisy of it of it still having ownership of the root. Um, and so uh, uh, getting, getting rid of the oversight role uh, could potentially free up the U.S. government to play a, a more positive role. Uh, you know, actually articulating something that's that's inspiring for you know the, the, the internet should be a borderless world, and that uh, you know we should have free flow of of ideas and exchange of ideas, and and making sure that our internet protocols do that. And I still think you know I, I think it's an open question whether the U.S. will seize that opportunity, but I think it has more of an opportunity now to do that and and to be more vocal uh, on a global stage now that it's not constantly. You know, as, as of tomorrow, hopefully, it's not constantly under attack for for the the role that it plays in in overseeing Ayana. Sure. So, regarding the four state AGs and the lawsuit they released yesterday, does anybody think that that holds any water? Uh, be able to stop the transition in any way? I don't know. Well, I mean, I to... it's. I mean, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a programmer. <laughs> but I mean, I my understanding is that. Uh, an injunction carries a fairly high burden, so it's a, a, a tough case for them to make. Uh, and I think the toughest part of the case is to make the case that they will somehow be injured, that these states will somehow be injured by this transition. I mean, and so I think on a purely legal level, it will be difficult uh, for this case to hold sway. But I mean, I, you know, nothing's ever purely legal uh, in the in the execution uh, of our judicial system. So I think there's still a chance that a, a TRO could take place, which would result in the Commerce Department uh, extending the contract a year. Um, and uh, now, luckily, there's the ability to either party to terminate the contract with mutual consent any time during that year. So mm -hmm. in theory, that year doesn't need to sound as extreme as it does. But uh, the whole purpose of this is to buy time until Congress is back in session to readdress this politically where they fail to do so here. Um, but I, I don't think that there's 
to the extent to which there is a, a case to be made, I don't think it's a case against the transition. I mean, it's a case about, uh, you know, government oversight and things like that and issues to be resolved about, you know, uh, budget riders and things like that where there appears to be a difference of opinion by legal authorities, but it's not a, uh, it's not a reason to hold up the transition. Also not a lawyer, but, uh, you know, I would also note that this is something that has potentially negative consequences for foreign policy and, and lower level federal courts are fairly, uh, you know, fairly careful about uh, wading into stuff with foreign policy impact. So uh, insofar as that's a factor, that's another reason to be sort of skeptical that they'll intervene. Well, Michael Frumkin uh, has written a, a blog post about this where he uh, basically lays to waste the legal arguments of the state attorneys general on discourse.net. And uh, one of the arguments he points out is that the claim of harm is purely speculative. You know, basically they're saying, oh, an unsupervised ICANN might just decide to turn off .gov. Very speculative. Um, oh, the other interesting aspect of this is that you have state governments asking you know, the federal government to keep doing something that it actually has no legislative authority to do, uh, on the ground, it, I mean, it's a, it's a very strange legal case to make uh, because there was, it was always a contractual arrangement between the federal government. Congress never passed any law saying, You're, "Here's how to do this. You should do this." It was all uh, executive branch stuff. Um, and um, the the property argument that the root is property. This uh, highly discredited argument. Uh, has been raised again in this case, and I think that uh, one just absolutely holds no water. The question, again, was whether a judge who isn't familiar with this stuff can see through these things as easily as uh, those of us who know it can. So did um, the government, the U.S. government, do a good job of oversight uh, for the for the past, in the past? Is that um, a norm that should be held? I think we all agree that the answer is no. Uh, but... What were some instances that made that clear to you? Well, there's a famous triple X case in which the U.S., um, basically the Bush administration got lobbied by right-wing groups who were anti-pornography, and they were joined by pornographers who didn't want there to be a triple X domain, and so they put a lot of pressure on, after ICANN passed a resolution saying they were going to permit this domain, uh, they threatened and that they were not going to put it into the root. There was a lot of political pressure. And um, uh, ICANN ultimately backed down and sort of reversed its decision based on this pressure. Um, there are, you need to understand sort of the political context in which uh, ICANN operates when it is tied to the U.S. government in this way. So every time the IANA contract was renewed, uh, there was an opportunity, a political opportunity, for any special interest group to put pressure on ICANN. So it wasn't just, oh, yeah, the IANA is a very indirect way of controlling things. It's like, oh, we don't think there should be new top-level domains. We can't win that battle in ICANN. Oh, the IANA contract's about to be renewed. Let's, let's modify the IANA contract so that every domain that's approved by ICANN has to be reapproved by IANA on a public interest justification. This is something the intellectual property interest tried to put into the IANA contract. Unfortunately, we flagged it and got it out, but there's just so many ways in which political interests in the U.S. get a second bite at the apple because it's all tethered to the U.S. in this way. So it would be a really healthy thing to just end that. I think overall, though, I mean, I, we talk about whether the United States government was successful in its oversight. I, I, I think that if you look at the, their entire record, it's largely a positive one of inaction, of, of allowing ICANN to proceed, to, to, to fix its own mistakes, to govern itself, etc., and to be resistant to doing the things that Wilm well, describes that I think really represent the exception and not the rule of their oversight. That said, I don't think that they exerted particularly strong management or guidance of the organization toward uh, the ideal outcome. In, in many ways, I think the U.S. oversight acted as a kind of crutch for ICANN, making it possible uh, for them to to not evolve with the pace that they would have otherwise needed to do, and I and I think that uh, 
Um, where the U.S. government has truly shined, though, with again with some possible exceptions, is in its defense of ICANN in the international community. I think it's acted uh, admirably as a protector of ICANN, much more so than it has as a manager of ICANN. And I think it's important to remember that role will continue, uh, you know, post transition. And and as Eli suggests, that that role will continue with potentially a higher moral ground than it's been able to occupy in the past. And, and I would say, actually, the thing that the it's still astonishing to me that the U.S. did well was was the origins of this system, right? Like the, going back to the Clinton administration, the framework on on uh, digital commerce, and then in setting up ICANN as a nonprofit. That's just uh, it, it almost seems like it came out of nowhere that it was just so so liberal and so so you know f- free free market, uh, uh, and, and that that it would. Um, that it would adopt this idea that no, the government doesn't need to be in control of this. This is, is in some sense too important for the government to be in control of. Um, but, you know, I think for someone who watches governments or studies governments, like that's actually surprising that a government would do that. And so, uh, you know, kudos to Ira Magaziner and and the Clinton administration for for having that foresight and and uh, sp- private essentially developing a private system for for governing the internet. Uh, Milton, you talked in your book, Network and States, uh, about denationalized liberalism. Uh, what is that concept, and do you think that the multi-stakeholder model embodies it? Um, to answer the last question uh, very abruptly, I would say no, it's not the perfect embodiment of denationalized liberalism. But I think you have to understand that um, the state, the states evolve, right? The, the form taken by the state in, you know, 1632 very different from the form taken uh, in the 1900s and uh, post-World War II. Essentially, you have, you really don't have a purely Westphalian system until the end of World War II and the formation of the United Nations and decolonization, the end of these great empires. So when I talk about denationalized liberalism, I'm not talking about the end of the entire nation state. I'm talking about in the sphere of communications and information Mm -hmm. governance, uh, the rationale for having sovereignty, for having territorial borders, it seems to me to be completely gone. And that you have to have some... The the liberal values can no longer be enforced by national laws and, and split jurisdictions, 192 of them or whatever it is. You have to come up with new globalized uh, or at least non-territorial institutions to to have a system of rules that uh, you know facilitates the free markets and free choices uh, that we as liberals would want. So that's pretty much what I mean. It's kind of it's not a specific institutional model I'm talking about. It's more like a goal and a breaking out of the constraints of the territorial state. So how do the IANA functions fit within that? Some have referred to them as sort of the ability to control the Internet, and others have called them purely clerical. Uh, how critical are those functions, and how should they be governed? It's a question of the day. Well, the, fu- the functions are, it's sort of like uh, the way regulatory systems work is they grab onto some piece of leverage, and they use that as leverage to extend their control in different means. So how did we get, you know, Federal Communications Commission control of broadcast licensing? You know, we got it because the spectrum needed to be allocated. And it's well known, probably by everybody here, that you don't need to have community ascertainment, public interest standards for content, all of this regulatory apparatus, simply because you need to allocate the spectrum. But a political system has its own dynamics and own interests, and so once you've grabbed control of the spectrum, it's inevitable that that will be used. You know, you could say, oh, spectrum management is just a clerical function. You, mm-hmm. you use that frequency, I use that one, but of course that's not how it plays out. It has massive implications for the entire communications industry, both from economic and political sense. So uh, it's more a question of not how do the IANA functions themselves affect the broader internet governance landscape. It's how are the institutional arrangements for doing the IANA functions uh, used to govern or not used to govern? Does anybody else want to add? I mean, I, I've gotten in trouble uh, throughout this whole thing about 
saying to people, this is like less important than you think. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and so, so I think, uh, you know, to clarify, uh, you know, it's, the ANA functions are very important to the way the internet is run today. Uh, but they could also still, that's totally consistent with they're overrated in importance. Uh, and so that's what I've tried to emphasize is that I think that they are overrated. It's very, it's very tempting for uh, any of us when we go in and talk to policymakers to say, listen up, this is very important. You have to pay attention. I know it's boring. You know, um, uh, but it is, you know, I think less important, uh, as I said, important to the way the Internet is run today, potentially less important in the future. There could be alternatives. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I hope uh, in, the, in the future that there are some checks on, on IANA that emerge simply from potential competition, even, even if it's not actually manifested competition, just that contestable monopoly idea, right? That, that we could have um, somebody else come in and, and threaten to, to provide an, an alternate service sort of lowers the uh, level of importance of, of the root zone uh, as, as commonly perceived by people who want to stop the transition. Now, one of the most uh, significant aspects of the reforms uh, was what I call the demystification of IANA and it's splitting up into the recognition of the three different communities that use the IANA functions. So this was considered actually very radical by the technical community, but they viewed it as a defensive mechanism. It was a brilliant move on their part. Uh, they knew that if the numbering and protocol functions got mixed up in the domain name wars, domain name politics, that whatever solution we came up with would be really bad, probably. So they said, hey, these are three different functions. There are three different communities that govern these functions. We give contractual authority to protocol parameters to the IETF. We give uh, contractual authority for the numbering functions to the numbers uh, registries. And those people are much more trustworthy in terms of not messing with them for political reasons than any other parties would be. Domain names is still a mess because ICANN didn't want to let go of it. Uh, and it wasn't clear who is the community that you're going to contract with. Uh, if you have a pure kind of industry-focused, uh, self-regulatory approach, it would obviously be the domain name industry and the registrars, perhaps. I mean, the, the registries and the registrars. But people uh, have so bought into this notion of broader sense of Internet governance that nobody was willing to do that. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to ask you what we should take away from this panel. These are basically closing statements. Um, what do you want the audience to walk away with? Eli, you can start. Um, yeah, I think it's really important to view the Internet as, as not a, a static thing. It's going to continue to evolve. And I'm really focused on uh, sort of the next phase of the evolution. And I think there's two, two uh, directions we could go. Uh, you know, one is sort of the, the more radical blockchain uh, sort of uh, solutions. And then uh, on the other hand, um, governments are still not out of the picture. They're, they're uh, working through the ITU to focus on uh, other, other parts of the internet protocol ecosystem, routing, um, identif identifying people online, uh, identifiers in general. Um, so uh, I think it's. I think that's where the next battle is. It's. It's sort of over the next generation protocols, and not so much over uh, over what we've been talking about today. Which you know, although still very important, um, I think we'll, we'll sort of sort of start to fade uh, in importance. So for me, the takeaway is we're stepping away from a national sovereignty based governance regime into a completely new world of denationalized. Governance, and I think it's extremely significant. I, I want people to understand why that is happening and how it still requires, you know, active input and vigilance in terms of keeping ICANN accountable going into the future. All right, Jonathan. I, I think the primary takeaway is that tomorrow is going to feel pretty much the same as today. The same groups are going to get together to try and form policy within ICANN. The same kind of Processes are going to be in place for inserting names into the root. It, it's 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 going to be far more the same than it's different, and and that much of the changes are only going to be realized uh, as sort of 
opportunities to test them appear quite a while down the road, in my belief. I, I think you'll see very little that's different uh, in November than what you saw in October. And I think that, that, that should give you a sense of calm associated with this transition. And, and that whatever vigilance is necessary going forward is no different than what was necessary up until now. So, uh, you know, enjoy your Halloween uh, with <laughs> impunity. It's not as scary as you think it is. Awesome. So now we have time for your questions.